right, we're ready for Hebrews chapter 10. I appreciate uh, Ricky Bruce taking the um, class last week while I was in a meeting and covering chapter 9. Our itinerary calls for us to split chapter 10 into two studies, and that we will do. So we're going to primarily focus on verses 1 to 18, and you'll see why that's the case in a moment. So, you just received questions, you should have as you came in, on chapter 10. There are two dates on that, today's date and next week's date. So, um, if you're looking for your questions for today, I didn't give those out last week. I didn't give those to Ricky to give out, forgot that. So, you've got them now. And um, those are the same questions you'll have for next week. So, if you fill them out now, you're done for next week. Anyway, be that as it may, we'll get to those questions here in a moment. Let's see where we are and where we're going. Chapters 1 through 10 and 18 mark the first major section. And as if you were listening just a moment ago, you noted that we are going to end verse 18, hopefully today. So we will finish the first major section of the book. And next week we launch into the second portion of the book. What I call the second half. Not half by number of verses, but half by, num by the outline. So we'll go into that second part. So the first major section of the book is Christ is the way. Keep on keeping on because Christ is the way, you're on the right course. And so we saw several things about Christ being the way in this. The superiority of his person, he's a superior to the, he's superior to the prophets, angels, and Moses, and Joshua. Uh, then we talked about the superiority of his work, his priesthood, which continues all the way through. Then he talks about his covenant, his sanctuary, and the sacrifice, which is part of the priesthood. And we're finishing that section today, and then we're ready next time to talk about don't give up. So the rest of the book basically is exhortation, keep on keeping on, don't give up because you know you're on the right course. But he took a while to lay that foundation in chapters 1 through 10 and 18. Let's review where we've been in the first nine chapters. Chapter 1. All right, Christ is superior to prophets and to angels. Chapter 2. Very good. Giving heed in the humanity of Christ. Chapter 3. Yeah, he's superior to Moses. And then there's this warning about not uh, hardening your heart. So he's superior to Moses. Very good. Chapter 4. Yeah, don't fail and hold fast. It's an outgrowth of chapter 3, part of that exhortation section. We'll look at those five sections in a moment. Chapter 5. Better high priest. Very good. He is. He introduces the, actually introduced that in chapter 4, but he develops it here in chapter 5 of him being our high priest and a better high priest at that. Chapter 6, we called an... All right, yeah, he's, it's an interlude. It's an encouragement to go on and uh, to greater maturity that he had introduced to him at the end of chapter 5. They call that an interlude. It's like he couldn't wait to get to chapter 10, this exhortation to keep moving on. You need, I need to give you that warning right now. Chapter 7, back to the... Priesthood. Yeah, very good. The, the Levitical priesthood, superior to that. Chapter 8. All right, yeah, better uh, ministry and a better priesthood. And then last week, chapter 9. Yeah, the first covenant serves as a type of the new. Now, that thought was not new in chapter 9, totally. Developed, yes, but introduced to us in chapter 8. Um, and so uh, we'll, say, we'll see more about that in chapter 10. Let's go to our questions for today, and then we'll come back to some things on our screen. Question number one, the main thought of this chapter, chapter 10. Say again. Exhortations, yes. Yeah, sacrifices are contrasted here. That is the sacrifice of the Levitical priesthood to the sacrifice of Christ. Those are put in contrast. Uh, and then there's the exhortation. that we, we split chapter 10, not only for our study, but chapter 10 splits in our outline. And uh, because he starts that exhortation at chapter 10 and verse 19 uh, is where we are. Uh, we'll come back to that. Let's go to our question number... Um, Number two, any references to or quotations from the Old Testament found in this chapter? What would they be? 
All right? Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8 are quoted. All right. All right, good. Anything else? Jeremiah 31 is quoted again. Where have we seen that quoted before? In Hebrews. Chapter 8. Very good. All right. That will be all that we're going to look at in today's lesson. Next week we'll look at some more. But uh, if you're following and you have the workbook, then you have uh, these references. But verses 5 to 7, quote from Psalm 40. Verse 8 quotes from Psalm 40 and verse 6. Verses 7 and 8 are quoted in verse 9, so he's quoting them multiple times. Notice he doesn't quote the entire chapter, but the portion that he needs to make his point. And then, it, it, and uh, we'll get into this in January some when we're going to shift gears in classes. We're going to have a class on hermeneutics on Wednesday night. And we're going to look at the book of Hebrews, how Hebrews teaches us about hermeneutics, how to interpret Scripture. Because that's exactly what the Hebrew writer does all through the book, is he takes Scripture and he interprets that. So uh, that's just a little footnote to be watching for. Verse 16 quotes from Jeremiah 31, and then later we'll notice next time Deuteronomy 32 is referenced, and, and Habakkuk 2 at the end is referenced. But we'll come back to those a little bit later. Anybody have anything else on question two? Let's go to question three. How did this chapter encourage those to whom it was written? All right, that's good. Sacrifice that Jesus made blots out all their sins. Anything else? Anybody put to question number three? Absolutely. It was not intended to be permanent at all. All right, yes, it's a superior sacrifice. Question number four, how does this chapter relate to us? You read it, you're not a Hebrew, you're not a first century Hebrew, you're not under persecution, Judaizing teachers are not after you, so it must mean something different to you. What does it mean? All right, have confidence our sins are taken away, removed, once and forever, that's good. What else? If we sin, we have a continual high priest that intercedes between us and God. So if we have future sin, they can also be forgiven if we repent, willing to repent. All right. That's good. This is more for next week, what, what I'm about to say. We, we learned several things, and uh, uh, what's just been mentioned here. But next week we're going to see what steadfastness involves, how to be steadfast, and reasons to be steadfast. We see all of that starting at verse 19 to the end of the chapter. Uh, exhortation, four reasons in fact he gives in the context for steadfastness. Here's why you need to be steadfast, and that applies as much to us as it does to anyone. Let's go ahead and get question five. What do you see in this chapter that shows the Old Testament's been taken away and the new is our guide? If you were talking to someone who says, we're still under the Old Testament and you're limited with chapter 10, that's all you can look at, how would you prove from chapter 10 that's the case? Old is taken away, we live under the new. Okay. All right. Never was intended to. Never was. Very good. What else? All right, that's good. Anything else? All right, that's probably sufficient to make that point. I think, that, and there may be a couple of other references we can make from the context. I like Jeremiah 31 says, a new covenant's coming. Um, but all of those are included in the comments that we've just made. All right, let's pick up now with chapter 10. In verse 1, let's look at our outline that we have of chapter 10 and make our way through, um, through the chapter. Here's where we uh, have been looking 
every week practically at this, these five sections. There's a doctrinal section followed by a warning section. And we're in this fourth of the five doctrinal sections and we're finishing that and then we get into a warning section. If there is another doctrinal section, some question whether it's really exhortation or doctrinal, it would be chapter 11, 1 to 40. And this, uh, ex exhorting us about the examples of faith. Here's what faith is, here's what it does. And then we're to have that same kind of faith. But anyway, better covenants, better sacrifices. Uh, we're in that doctrinal section winding that up. Here's what chapter 10 is about. Chapter 10 does two things, and we're going to focus on the first. The sacrifice is contrasted. That is the Levitical priesthood sacrifice to the sacrifice of Christ. They're contrasted to one to the other. And then the rest of the chapter begins that whole second section of the book, and that is exhortation to be steadfast. So here's what we're going to see in 1 to 18. The Levitical system was not sufficient at all, verses 1 to 4. That's the point. Then starting at verse 5, Christ's offering is all sufficient. So there's the contrast. We'll get to the details in a moment. But the, the first, that is the Levitical priesthood, the Old Testament economy, was not sufficient. The priesthood of Christ, his sacrifice, is all sufficient. We need nothing else. And that is all the argument he needs, uh, needs to make. So chapter 10 serves to, as a transition point, getting us from the first major section that Christ is the way to making the point that we're not to give up. He develops these points, uh, so, some of the same points that he's been introducing to us all through the book, but he's going to uh, drive some points home with some new ideas or at least some new terminology that we're going to see. Let's talk about verses 1 to 4 now concerning the Levitical priesthood. We're not learning a great deal new, but we're learning some new language perhaps. Um, so starting at verse 1, I want to look at three things here. It's not the image but the shadow. I want to drop down to verse 3. We're going to skip verse 2 for a moment. And the remembrance is made a sin every year, and then it could not forgive sin. So here's why it was insufficient. Uh, let's talk about this image. Verse 10, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. You might underline that word shadow. Stephen has mentioned this a couple of times already. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. In other words, the law was merely the shadow of the better to come can never with those sacrifices which they continually offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So here's the point. It was called a shadow. The Old Testament economy was called a shadow. You might back up to chapter 8 and in verse 5. That thought had been introduced to us before where the Old Testament was called a copy or a shadow. And we used another term, model, uh, or a type. It's the type of the better to come. Uh, of the real. It's a shadow of that which is real. It is a copy of that which is real. It is a model of that which is real. Copy, type, or shadow. There are two thoughts with reference to the word shadow. And if you have the workbook, you have these quotations there. Here's the first that you find in your workbook as from Albert Barnes. And Barnes made this point that the word shadow here, he said, refers to a rough outline of anything or a mere sketch such as a carpenter draws with a piece of chalk or such as an artist delineates when he's about to make a picture. You can imagine an artist taking a canvas and he just draws and sketches this outline and then later he paints it and fills it in now he has this beautiful picture but that outline or that sketch, Barnes suggests, is this word for shadow. He sketches an outline of the object, and then he draws, which he has some resemblance to it, but it's not the very image, for it is not yet complete. The words rendered the very image refer to a painting or a statue, uh, which is finished, where every part is the exact copy of the original. The good things to come refer to the future blessings that are conferred on man by the gospel. The idea is that under the ancient sacrifices, there was an imperfect representation and I like his wording here, a dim outline of the blessings which the gospel would impart to man. That is, now that we know what the New Testament looks like, we can go back to the Old Testament and we get a glim, dim picture of how great the blessings are in Christ. But not like we do when we get to the New Testament. Does that make sense? So you're watching this artist draw and he draws out this sketch and you say, that looks like a mountain scene and it looks like maybe a, a lake in front of the mountain. I don't really know, but it, I kind of get the picture, but you really get the clear picture over here when he's finished. 
Well, Barnes may be right about that. Uh, Barnes approaches it from that vantage point. A.T. Robertson, whom I have more confidence in uh, than I do Barnes, uh, because he's a lexicographer and not a commentator. But Robertson observes that the word shadow can mean a shade cast by light, and thus that's why the translator so used the word. Uh, and he mentions here that it is, uh, th th that the point is that the, the old sacrifices is not the true image, but merely a resemblance. As a man's uh, shadow is cast upon the ground, or the tree's shadow is cast upon the ground, it's merely the resemblance of that. I like what Barnes says, but, but perhaps uh, the idea of a Robertson may better represent what's going on. So all the argument is, the Old Testament was not the real, it's not the new, I mean, it's not the real, it's not the true, it's merely the image. And so you're being attached to the shadow when the real image is that which is important. Make sense? That's all he's saying. Nothing new, nothing we didn't already know. We're just borrowing the language from chapter 8 and then chapter 10. Questions or comments on the idea of shadow? Every, every, any kind of uh, ladies that, that so do this, uh, carpenters, we do this. Uh, I draw out pictures of, of what I'm building, and here's what it looks like. And that rough draft is just a sketch. It's just a shadow. It's, it's, a, it's an outline of what I'm about to build. Uh, the building is hopefully better than the draft. All you're doing is just drawing something out. You can't. Right. There, there is a plan, and there is there is a platform that they're working off of, and uh, obviously that is the uh, the shadow. Let's notice the second thing. I want to skip verse two because I'm coming back to that. But look at verse three. That the Levitical system was insufficient because, number one, it was not the image, it's the shadow. It's insufficient because remembrance is made of sin every year. Let's get the wording of verse 3. Um, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, every time they make that sacrifice. It refers to the Day of Atonement, Le Leviticus 16 is, is the reference. That every year when, on the Day of Atonement, when a sacrifice was made, that sacrifice was not made for sins they've committed within that last year, but the sins they'd committed even before that, before that last sacrifice was made. So those sins were remembered again every year. Uh, some object to the terminology of, se the, the old expression used to be sins were rolled forward every year. That language is not used. That concept, I'm convinced, is. That it was remembered, if it's remembered again every year, whatever you want to call it, roll forward or move forward or remembered, use the term you like. But it was remembered again every year. So whatever sins were forgiven 10 years ago are still being sacrificed for, again, this year and next year and the next year and the next. Make sense? <coughs> All right. Now notice back at verse 2, there was still the consciousness of sin. That is, we're going to come back to that. Had, they taken, had the, the sacrifice taken the sin away, there wouldn't be a consciousness of sin. But every year they're made aware of the fact that I still have those sins that we made sacrifices for last year. And the year before, and the year before, and the year before, and the year before. Make sense? So sins are remembered again every year. Um, a quote in the workbook from Dan King, he said, The cultic rites actually brought past sins into the present. I like his wording of that. And that is, the, the, the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement for last year was made, but when it comes around this year, that sacrifice actually brings all of those sins up to the present. Does that make sense? 
So they're remembered this year. And so we have to make a sacrifice for them this year. And then the next year at the Day of Atonement, those, those sins are brought again to the present. Make sense? So he's arguing for the fact that the remembrance is made of those sins every year. Now, at verse 4, he's going to say, for, here's why that's true, it's not possible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. And he's going to contrast that, and you might draw a contrast from verse 3, there's a reminder every year of those sins, to verse 17. What do you see in verse 17 is the contrast. Yeah, God said, I'll remember those sins no more. Now, you think of the beauty of that where the Jews coming through the system remembered that, you know, this year I'm remembering all the sins I've ever committed. Uh, not that every sin's coming through your mind, but that's, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with every sin I've ever done before. And the next year I'm dealing with every sin I've ever done before. And the next year I'm dealing with every sin that's ever been done before. But under the sacrifice of Christ, when you're forgiven, all those sins are gone and never remembered again. I might have to deal with another sin, but those sins are gone forever. The beauty of that contrast is what he's trying to do. Questions or comments before we go further? So they never got into the group, so they never, they didn't have yeah. to keep the yeah. Can't find the group. yeah, we're doing what God told us to do. We made the sacrifice, but, but there's got to be a better, there had to be in the mind of every Jew, there's got to be a better way. And God had planned the better way. It's not that God planned an insufficient way. God had planned a better way, but it's yet to come. All right. Now let's go back to verse 1, verse 2, and verse 4. Here's why it was insufficient. It was simply a shadow, never intended to be the permanent thing. Secondly, the remembrance is made again of sin every year, but the sins could not be forgiven, nor was it designed to be that way. So notice the wording of uh, three passages here. Verse 1. Um, verse 1 said, those uh, sins were repeatedly offered. I've lost my page here. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 10 that they continually offer those sacrifices. So the fact that they are continually offered suggests the sacrifices couldn't take away sin. Secondly, verse 2 said, uh, for then why would they have ceased to, uh, for then would they have not ceased to be offered? What's, his, what's the point of his question? Yeah. If the sacrifice took care of the sin, they don't need to make that same sacrifice next year for those sins and the next year for all those sins again. You don't need to make sacrifices again and again. For the worshipers once purged would have no more consciousness of sin. Now then at verse 4, he said the blows, bulls, uh, blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. And the point is it never was intended to take away that sin. So sin could not be forgiven under the old covenant. All right, let's stop and footnote just for a moment and... Uh, we ought to be able to find the answer in Hebrews or Romans 1. Could people under the Old Testament then be forgiven? On what basis? There are two passages that make this point. One is in Romans, and Lou's right. And there's another one in Hebrews. 719. I'm sorry, what'd you say, Annie Lou? All right, we'll, we'll find the one in Romans. We ought to be familiar with the one, if you were here last week, 9 and 15, very good. Chapter 9 and 15, for this reason he is a mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. That is, the sacrifice of Christ takes care of the, uh, of the sins of the... Uh, people under the first covenant. Make sense? Does that make sense? All right. Uh, now Romans chapter 3 and in verse 25, for whom God set forth to be a perpetuation through, uh, by, by his blood through faith to demonstrate the righteousness because his uh, 
for forbearance, in his forbearance, God passed over the sins previously committed. Referring to God forgave people under the old covenant, but not on the blood of bulls and goats. It was a basis on the coming sacrifice. Now, here's the illustration that, that I think captures the thought. If you ever bought something at, at a store and you didn't pay for it, it's 30 day, a 90 day same as cash, whatever. And so if you take something without paying for it, it's called stealing. But they let you take it, and on, on what basis? That in 90 days, you're going to make a payment. And that's God forgave people based on a coming payment. When Jesus made the payment, that's taken care of. Make sense? That's what Hebrews 9, 15, Romans 3, 25 says. All right, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10 now and, and see if we can finish this 5 to 10, or 5 to 18 now. All right, the Levitical system was insufficient. Never was intended to be sufficient. It was sufficient for what it was designed to do, but it was never designed to take away sin. All right, we know that. Let's get 5 to 8 because this gets interesting in his quotation from Psalm 40. That Christ's offering is all sufficient for two reasons. It fulfills the will of God, and then there's absolute forgiveness obtained through that. All right, let's get this first section. It fulfills the will of God. He quotes again from what passage? Psalm 40. So you might open your Bible and turn over to Psalm 40 because there is a little discrepancy here in Psalm 40 or between Psalm 40 and our text in the book of Hebrews. A little bit of discrepancy. Uh, he is quoting from the Septuagint translation uh, but that quotation does not agree with the Septuagint and the Hebrew uh, and the Septuagint don't completely agree. The wording is varied a little bit. And it's not a contradiction, it's just different wording. Um, so here's the point of the psalm. The point of the psalm is genuine obedience. And that's the point being made here. Let's get that point, then we're going to go both to the psalm and the Hebrews and get the point that he's fulfilling the will of God. He came, that is, the Son came to do the will of God, to make the sacrifice. And the point of the psalm is genuine obedience to the will of God. Now, let's go over to Psalm 40, and notice at verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened. That's not quoted. My ears have you opened is replaced with the phrase, but a body you have prepared me. It's not a contradiction, but somewhere between the translation from the uh, Hebrew into the Greek, then back into the English, the, the words have changed somehow. I don't have an explanation for that. But King and others can, can explore that and if you want to go further. But here's the point I want you to see. How do we harmonize those two, two phrases? And that is, the ears being opened is a reference to willing obedience, and Christ was given a body that he might be obedient to the will of God. Had Christ not come in the flesh and get, been given a body, he could not have fulfilled the will of God, would he? Because the will of God was for him to come and to die as a sacrifice and shed his blood. There could be no blood shed unless he'd been given a body. So they do harmonize. They're not contradictory at all. So go back to Psalm 40 and verse 6. Sacrifice and an offering you did not desire. My ears have you opened. In other words, I'm willing to, to be obedient. But a body you have given me. That's how he became obedient, uh, if that makes sense to you. Now, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and get, get the point. Uh, in verse 5 and 6 and 7, he quotes from the psalm. Let's get the psalm. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But a body you prepared me, and a burnt offering and sacrifice for sin you had no pleasure. In other words, God didn't have pleasure in the, in the sacrifices. In other words, they didn't satisfy God's wrath. And I come in the volume of the book to do your will, O God. So uh, you are not pleased with those sacrifices. In other words, they didn't satisfy the wrath of God. There had to be a sacrifice that would satisfy the wrath of God. That is the perfect blood of Christ. God's always demanded blood sacrifices, Leviticus 17, because life is in the blood. And so consequently, he said, I came to be obedient and do that. Now, verses 8 through 10 here uh, has to do, at the end of that, that's, I'm still under point one, B1, 
verses 8 through 10 is a summary of what that psalm is actually saying. So here is, here is his commentary. Here's his interpretation of that. Previously saying, sacrifice and burnt offering and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them. That's a quotation from the psalm. Which are offered according to the law. He applied that to the offerings under the law. That is, the sacrifices and the offerings under the law of Moses under the Levitical system, God was not pleased with. But I thought God commanded them, yes. I thought God said to do them, and when they did it exactly like he told them, he should have been pleased. He was pleased with the fact that they offered those sacrifices, but it didn't satisfy the, the need for salvation. That's the point. Now then, verse 9. And he said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. And when he did that, what's the comment made at the end of verse 9? Yeah. He takes away the first that he might establish the second. That is, Christ came in the flesh to fulfill the plan for redeeming man. And when he did, when he did, he took away the first system that he might establish the second system. Here's, a, here's something I'm learning. And if you're looking in your, foot, uh, in your workbook, look at footnote number seven. Man cannot live under two differing systems of law at the same time. That's why he has to take one away before he can have the second. Because they're differing systems of law. The Old Testament law had a different priesthood. If it's enforced, then Christ can't be our priest. If Christ is our priest, there has to be a change in the law. We've already established that. So he had to take one away before we can have the second one. You can't have Christ if you have the Levitical system. If you have the Levitical system, you can't have Christ. You can't have them both. Make sense? So he had to take one away that the second may be established. And when he came to do the will, O oh God, he... Uh, he took one away and established his I know that's simplistic, but that's his argument uh, that he's making. All right, now verse 10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What's his point? It's all sufficient. It's all sufficient, and he came to do the will of God. So it's all sufficient because it, it's what God designed and what God planned. And he quotes from their law that they trust in the Psalms, Psalm 40, to make that point. Now let's get 10 to 18 in the time we've gotten left. The absolute forgiveness is obtained. He's already talked about this where? In Hebrews? That absolute forgiveness is available and uses the same passage, same argument. Let me give you a hint. It's not in chapters 1 to 7. It's not in 9 and 10. So that leaves chapter... Ah, there we go. Chapter 8. That's where it's found. Chapter 8. Chapter 8 and chapter 10 is where this is quoted. Now, let's talk about that absolute forgiveness in, in verses 10 to uh, uh, 18. Notice uh, this wording. I, I catch verse 10d. The offering of the body of Christ once for all. We'll come back to that. Now he says at verse 11, every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Let's get verse 12. And, uh, but, but this man, that is Jesus, after he's offered one sacrifice for sin, sat at the right hand of God and will stop there. What's the contrast of two, two major words that are used there? Maybe four. All right, daily and once. That's good. Standing and setting. All right. Notice the contract. The Old Testament system, the priesthood, continually offered sacrifice, and they stood. I don't think it's the matter of trying to indicate they, they're, they're in a standing position versus kneeling position, whatever they were doing. But you stand to do something because you don't ever get through with it. Does that make sense? But when you sit down from a job, what does that indicate usually? You're done. You're finished. So the picture is these priests continually stand. They stand and they got to keep standing because they got offered again. And they got to stand because they got offered again. And they got to stand because they got offered again. So they're continually standing where Jesus made one sacrifice and he sat down. He's done. And he's not going to stand again to make a sacrifice because he don't need it. One sacrifice took care of it all. Now, he's going to give us evidence of that. Now, beginning at verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. That's interesting. 
He perfected them forever. Now then, verse 15, And the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he said before, and now he quotes from, Jeremiah 31. Let's stop and footnote now. We'll come back to the argument. What did you just learn from verse 15 about Jeremiah? He's inspired. We saw the same thing about David earlier. Remember uh, Psalm 95 was quoted and said, David said, and then another time he quoted from Psalm 95 and he said, the Holy Spirit said. David was inspired. Well, we see the same thing here. He said the Holy Spirit gave witness to us and he quotes the word from Jeremiah. So that tells us Jeremiah was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Here is evidence of divine inspiration of the scriptures. Here is a New Testament writer who could work miracles telling us and endorsing the Old Testament as being inspired. All right, here's the quotation. Jeremiah 31. What do you learn from Jeremiah 31? What's his... The point in Hebrews 8 was more the emphasis of a new covenant with better promises. This time he's only focusing on the, which of those two? Better promises, isn't he? What does he focus on? We'll make a new covenant, and I'll write my laws in their hearts and their minds, and, I did, and their sins and their iniquities are lawless deeds. I will, and you might underline, remember no more. That's a contrast to verse 3 and 4 of remembering the sins every year, remember no more. Yeah, absolutely. That's in the new covenant. Now then, let's finish with verse 18. We're about done. Um, now, where there is remission of, those, of these, or forgiveness, your footnote will say, there is no longer an offering for sin. What does that mean? All right, they're gone for good. When, when, when complete forgiveness is available, there's not need for another sacrifice. So back to this contrast, That's why they were continually standing because the next year, do we need a sacrifice? Yeah, we got to have a sacrifice because those sins hadn't been taken care of. There's not complete forgiveness. The next year, is there a need for a sacrifice? Yeah, there's a need for a sacrifice. You bet. All right? Now, I'm not talking about whether or not we may need forgiveness in the future, but is complete forgiveness available to us? Yeah. Do we need another sacrifice? No. Because it's been done and finished and it's over and there's not a need for another sacrifice. Because where there is remission of these, there's no more offering for sin. There's not another sacrifice coming. Because forgiveness is available through the sacrifice that's already been made. So it's not like, can somebody make a sacrifice for us and, and let's get that sacrifice made so we can be forgiven. It was done. It was done and it's finished and it's over. Questions or comments? All right, good point. Question number six. We maybe have 30 seconds here. Uh, Practical things you learn from verses 1 to 18. There's more to be learned, perhaps more practical things from the next section. But what did you learn from verses 1 to 18 you take home? That's a good point. (laughs) Build a house and then live out there in the shadow. Good point. Got time for one more. Jesus' sacrifice is all we need, and we'll stop on that. We'll finish chapter 10 next time.